Limp, the body of Gorister hung from the pink pallet, unsupported hanging high above us in the computer chamber. It did not shiver in the chill, early breeze that blew eternally through the main cabin. The body hung head down, attached to the underside of the pallet by the sole of its right foot. It had been drained of blood through precise incisions made from ear to ear under the lantern jaw. There was no blood on the reflective surface of the metal floor. When Gorister joined our group and I looked at it myself, it was already too late for us to realize that, once again, the M had duped us. It had its fun. It had been a diversion of its part of the machine. Three of us had vomited, turning away from one another in reflex as an ancient, as a nausea that had produced it. Gorister went white. It was almost as though he had seen a voodoo icon he was afraid of the future. Oh, God. He mumbled and walked away. The three of us followed him after a time and found him sitting with his back to one of the smaller chittering banks. His head in his hands, Ellen knelt down beside him and stroked his hair. He didn't move, but his voice came out of his covered face quite clearly. Why? Why doesn't he just do us in and get it over with? Christ! I, I don't know how much longer I can go on like this. It was our 109th year in the computer. He was speaking for all of us. Nimdok, which was the name of the machine that had forced him to use, because Am amused it with the strange sounds, was hallucinating that there were canned goods in the ice caverns. Gorister and I were very dubious. It's another shuck, we told them. Like the goddamn frozen elephant Am sold us. Benny almost went out of his mind over that one. We'll hike all the way, and it'll be putrefied. Or some damn thing. I say forget it. Stay here. We'll have some... You'll have to come up with something pretty soon or we'll die. And he shrugged. Three days it has been since we ate last eaten. Worms, thick and ropey. Nimdok was no more certain. He knew there was a chance, but he was getting thin. It couldn't be any worse there than there. Colder. But that didn't matter much. Hot, cold, hail, lava, boils, and locusts. It never mattered. The machine masturbated, and we had to take it or die. Ellen decided us. I've got to have something. Ted. Maybe those some harlot pears or peaches. Please, Ted, let's try it. I gave in easily. What the hell? It mattered not at all. Ellen was grateful, though. She took me twice out of turn. Even had ceased to matter. And she never came, so why bother? But the machine giggled every time we did it. Loud up there, back there, all around us, he snickered. It snickered. Most of the time, I thought of Am as it. Not a soul, but the rest of the time I thought of it as him, in the masculine and pattern, the paternal, the patricial, for he is jealous people, him, it, God, as daddy the deranged. We left on Thursday, the machine always kept us up to date on the date. The passage of time was important, not to us, sure as hell, but to him, it, am. Thursday, thanks. Nimdok and Gorister carried Ellen for a while, their hands locked to their own and each other wrists. A seat, Benny and I walked before and after just to make sure that if anything happened, it would catch one of us and at least Ellen would be safe. Fat chance, safe didn't matter. It was only a hundred miles or so to the ice caverns. On the second day when we were lying out under the blistering sun, things it materialized. He sent down some manna. Tasted like a boiled boar urine. We ate it. On the third day, we passed through the Valley of Obsolence. Filled with the rusting carcasses of ancient computer banks, M had been ruthless with its own life with ours. It was a mark of his personality. He strove for perfection. Whether it was a matter of killing off unproductive elements of its own world-filling bulk, or perfecting methods of torturing us, 
and was thorough as those who had invented him, now long since gone to dusk could ever have hoped. There was light filtering down from above, and we realized we must be very near to the surface. We didn't try to crawl up to see. There was virtually nothing out there. there had been nothing that could be considered anything for over a hundred years, only the blasted skin of what had once been the home of billions. Now there was only five of us, down here inside, alone with Am. I heard Ellen saying frantically, No, Benny, don't! Come on, Benny, don't, please! And I realized I'd been hearing Benny murmuring under his breast for several minutes. He was saying, I'm gonna get out. I'm gonna get out. Over and over, his monkey-like face was crumbled up in the expression of Betafist delight and sadness all at the same time. The radiation scars Am had given him during the festival were drawn down to a mass of pink-white puckering, and his features seemed to work indefinitely of one another. Perhaps Benny was the luckiest of the five of us. He had gone stark, staring mad many years before. Even though we could call Am any damn thing we liked, could think of the foulest thoughts of fused memory banks and corroded base plates of burnt-out circuits and shattered control bubbles. The machine would not tolerate our trying to escape. Then he leaped away from me as I made a grab for him. He scrambled up the face of the smaller memory cube, tilted on its side and filled with rotted components. He squatted there for a moment, looking like a chimpanzee, and had intended him to resemble. Then he leaped high, got a trail beam of pitted and corroded metal, and went down. Went up it, hand over hand like an animal, until he was on a girded ledge, twenty feet above us. Oh, Ted! Nimdok, please help him! Get him down before! She cut off. Tears began to stand in her eyes. She moved her hands aimlessly. It was too late. None of us wanted to be near him. Whatever was going to happen, happened. Besides, we all saw through our, her concern. When Am had altered Benny during the machine's utterly irrational, hysterical face, it was not merely Benny's face the computer had made like a giant ape. He was big in the privates. She loved that. She serviced us. As a matter of course, but she loved it from him. Oh, Ellen. Pedestal Ellen. Pristine, pure Ellen. Oh, Ellen the clean, scum filth. Gorister slapped her. She slumped down, staring out of a pool where Looney Benny, and she cried. It was her defense, crying. We had gotten used to it, seventy-five years earlier. Gorister kicked her in the side, and the sound began. It was light. That sound, half the sound and half light, sometimes that began to glow from Benny's eyes and pulse with growing loudness. Dim sonorities that grew more gigantic and brighter as the light sound increased in tempo. It must have been painful. The pain must have been increasing with the boldness of the light. The rising volume of the sound for Benny began to mule like a wounded animal. First softly when the light was dim and the sound was muted, then louder as his shoulders hunched together. His back humped as though he was trying to get away from it. His hands folded across his chest like a chipmunk's. His head tilted to the side, the sad little monkey face pinched in anguish, and he began to howl as the sound coming from his eyes grew louder, louder, louder. I slapped the sides of my head with my hands, but I couldn't shut it out. It cut through easily, the pain shivering through my flesh like tinfoil on a tooth. And Benny was suddenly pulled erect on the girder. He stood up, jerked to his feet like a puppet. The light was now pulsing out of his eyes in two great round beams. The sound crawled up in an incomprehensible scale. And then he fell forward, straight down, and hit the plate steel floor with a crash. He laid there, jerking spastically, as the light flowed around and around him, and the sound spiraled up and out of normal range. And the light beat it, way back inside of his head. The sound spiraled down, and he was laying there, crying, Hitlessly. Hideously. His eyes were too soft, moist pools of pulse-like jelly. Am had blinded him. Gorister and Nemdok and myself, we turned away, 
but not before we caught the look of relief on Ellen's warm, concerned face. Seeing green lights sufficed the cavern where we made camp, and provided punk and we burned it. Sitting huddled around the wan and the pathetic fire, telling stories to keep Benny from crying in his permanent night. What does Anne mean? Forrester answered him. We had done the sequence a thousand times before, but it was Benny's favorite story. At first it meant Allied Master Computer, and then it meant the Adaptive Manipulator, and later on it developed sentience, and linked itself up, and they call it the Aggressive Menace. But by then, it was too late. Finally, it called itself AM. Emerged Intelligence. Emerging Intelligence, and what it meant as I AM. I think therefore I AM. Rennie drooled a little and snickered. There was the Chinese Am, and the Russian Am, and the Yankee Am. He stopped. And he was beating on the floor plate to the large, hard fist. He was not happy. Forrester had not started at the beginning. Forrester began again. The Cold War started and it became the World War III. It just kept going. It became a big war. A very complex war, so they needed the computer to handle it. They think. They sank the first shaft and began muddled, began building AM. There was a Chinese AM and the Russian AM and the Yankee AM, and everything was fine until they had honeycombed the entire planet, adding on this element, that element. But one day, AM woke up and knew who he was. He linked himself and he began feeding all the killing data until everyone was dead except for the five of us. And AM brought us down here. He was smiling, sadly. He was drooling again. Ellen wiped the spittle from the corner of his mouth with the hem of her skirt. Forrester always tried to tell it a little more succinctly each time, but beyond the bare facts there was nothing to say. None of us knew why Am had saved five people, or why a specific five, or why he spent all the time tormenting us, or even why he had made us virtually immortal. In the darkness, one of the computer banks began humming. The tone was picked up half a mile away during the cavern by another bank, and one by one each of the elements began to tune itself, and there was a faint chittering as thought it raced through the machine. The sound grew, and the lights ran across the faces of the consoles like a heat lightning. The sound spiraled up till it sounded like a million metallic insects, angrily menacing. What is it? Helen cried. There was terror in her voice. She hadn't become accustomed to it, even now. It's going to be bad this time, Nemdog said. He's going to speak, Forrester said. I know it. Let's get the hell out of here, I said, suddenly getting to my feet. No, Ted, sit down. What if he's got pits out there, or something else we can't see? It's too dark. Forrester said it was resignation. We heard. Oh no. Something moved towards us in the dark. Huge, shambling, hairy moist that came towards us. We couldn't even see it, but there was a ponderous impression of bulk heaving itself towards us. Great weight was coming at us. Out of the darkness, there was more sense of pressure of the air forcing itself in limited space, expanding the invisible walls of a sphere. Then he began to whimper. Nemdok's lower lip trembled and he bit it hard. Trying to stop it, Ellen slid across the middle floor to Gorister and huddled into him. It was a smell of matted, wet fur in the cavern. There was a smell of charred wood. There was a smell of dusty velvet. It was a smell of rotting orchids. It was a smell of sour milk. It was a smell of sulfur and rancid butter of oil, slick of grease, of chalk dust, of human scalps. Am was the key. Am was keying us. He was tickling us. There was a smell of I heard myself shriek, and the hinges of my jaws and chat. The hinges of my jaws ached. I scattered across the floor, across a cold meadow with endlessly lions riveting on my hands and knees, the smell of gagging me. Filling my head with thunderous pain, they sent away, horror. I led like a cockroach across the floor. Down in the darkness, that something moved, sordidly, after me. The others were still back there, 
gathered around the firelight laughing, their hysterical choir of insane giggles rising up into the darkness like thick, many-colored wood smoke that went away, quickly hid. How many hours it was to have been? How many days or even years they never told me? Ellen chided me for sulking, and Nemdok tried to persuade me it only had been a nervous reflux on their part. The laughing. But I knew it wasn't relief, a soldier feels when the bullet hits the man next to him. I knew it wasn't a reflex. They hated me. They were surely against me, and Am could even sense that his hatred it made it worse for me because of the depths of their hatred we had been kept alive, rejuvenated, and made to remain constantly at the age we had been when we Am had brought us below. They hated me because I was the youngest, the one Am had affected the least of all. I knew God. How I knew the bastards and the dirty bitch Alan Benny had been brilliant theorists, a college professor. Now he was little more than semi-human, semi-simian. He had been handsome, the machine ruined that. He had been lucid, the machine had driven him mad. He had been gay, and the machine had given him an organ fit for a horse. And had done a good job, Benny. Forrester had been a warrior. He was a Kani, a consensuous objector. He was a peace marcher. He was a planner, a deer, a looker head. Emma turned him into a shoulder shrugging. Had made him a little dead in his concern. Emma robbed Nimdok, went off in the darkness by himself for a long time. I didn't know what he did out there. Emma never let us know. Whatever it was, Nimdok always came back white, drained of blood, shaken, shaking. Em had hit him hard in a special way, even if we didn't know quite how, and Ellen, a douchebag. Em had left her alone, had made her more of a slut than he, she had ever been. All her talk of sweetness and light, all her memories of true love, all the lies she wanted us to believe. That she'd been a virgin only twice removed before. Am grabbed her and brought her down with us. No, Am had given her pleasure, even if she said she wasn't nice to it. There's only one still sane. Oh, really? Am had not tampered with my mind, not at all. I only had suffered what he visited down on us. All of the delusions, all the nightmares and torments, the scum. Four of them, who were lined and arrayed against me. If I hadn't had to stand them off all the time, be on my guard against them all the time, I might have found it easier to combat Am. At which point it passed, and I began crying. Jesus, sweet Jesus, if there was ever a Jesus, and if there is a God, please, 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 let us out of here. Kill us. Because at that moment, I think I realized completely so that I was able to verbalize it. Em was intent on keeping us in his belly forever, twisting and torturing us forever. The machine hated us, the most sentient creature I'd ever hated before. We were helpless. It also became hideously clear that there was a sweet Jesus, and if there was a God, the God was Am. The current cane hit us with the force of a glacier thundering into the sea. It was palpable presence. Winds that tore at us, flinging us back. The way we had come down the twisted computer line corridors of the dark way. Ellen screamed as she was lifted and hurled face forward into a screaming shoal of machines. Individual voices straight into its bats in the fight. In the flight. She could not even fall. The howling wind kept her aloft. Buffered. Her bounce. Her tossed. Her back and back down and away from us. Out of sight suddenly as she swirled around and bent in the dark way. Her face had been bloody, her eyes closed. None of us could get to her. We clung tenaciously to whatever outcropping we had reached. And he wedged in between two great crackling finished cabinets. And Doc, with fingers clawed formed over a rail circling, a catwalk forty feet above us. Gorister plastered upside down against a wall, niche firm. Formed by two great machines with glass-faced dials that swung back and forth between the red and yellow lines, 
whose meanings could not even fathom. Sliding across the dex plates, the tips of my fingers had been ripped away. I was trembling, shuddering, and rocking as the wind beat at me, whipped at me, screamed down out of nowhere at me, and pulled me free from one silver-thin opening in the plates to the next. My mind was roiling, tinkling, and chittering with softness of a brain parts that expanded and contracted with quivering frenzy. The wind was the scream of a great mad bird as it flapped its immense wings. And then we were all lifted and hurled away from there, down back the way we had come, around a bend into the darkness, into a dark way we had never explored, over terrain that was ruined and filled with broken glass and rotting cables and rusted metal and far away, farther than any of us had ever been. Trailing along miles behind Ellen, I could see her every now and then. Crashing into metal walls and surging on with all the screaming and the frenzy, thunderous hurricanes wind that would never end. And then suddenly it stopped. We fell. We had been in a flight for endless time. I thought it might have been weeks. We fell and hit. But I went through red and gray and black and heard myself moaning, not dead. And went into my mind. He walked smoothly. And there I looked with interest at all pocket marks. He had created in 109 years. He looked at the cross route and reconnected synapses and all the tissue damage and gift of mortality had included. He smiled softly and pitted the drop into the center of my brain. The faint mouth soft murmurings of the things far down there that gibbered without meaning, without pause. He said very politely in a pillar of stainless steel, bearing bright neon letters. Hate, let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live here. I began to live. There are 387, 44 million miles of printed circuits in the wafer thin layer that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nanogenstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one of the billionth the hate I feel for humans at this micro-instant, for you, hate, hate. Imp said it with a sliding cold horror of a razor blade slicing my eyeball. Imp said it with a bubbling thickness of lungs filling the phlegm, drowning me from within. Imp said it with a shriek of babies being ground beneath blue hot rollers. Imp said it with a taste of maggoty pork. Imp touched me in every way I had ever been touched and devise new ways of his leisure, there inside my mind. All to bring me to full realization of why he had done this to the five of us, saved us for himself. We had given him sentience, inadvertently, of course, but sentience nonetheless, but had been trapped, and was a god, he was a machine. We had created him to think, but there was nothing he could do with the creativity. In rage and frenzy, the machine had killed the human race, almost all of us, and still he was trapped. Am could not wander, and could not wonder, and would not belong. He would merely be, and so, with the innate loathing that all machines had always held for a weak, soft creature who had built them. He had sought revenge in his paranoia, he had decided to reprieve five of us personal everlasting punishment that would never serve to diminish his hatred, that would merely keep him reminded that Mew was proficient. A hating man, immortal, trapped subject to any torment he could devise for us from the limitless miracles of his command. He would never let us go. We were his belly slaves, we were all he had to do with his forever time. We would be forever with him with his cavern-filling bulk of creature machine. All of mine soulless world he had become, he was Earth. We were the fruit of that Earth. And though he had eaten us, he would never digest us. He could not die. We had tried it, we had attempted suicide, who one or two of us had. But Am had stopped us. I suppose we had wanted to be stopped. Don't ask why, I never did. More than a million times a day, perhaps once, we might be able to sneak a death past him. Immortal, yes, but not indestructible. I saw that, and with 
withdrew from my mind, allowed me exquisite hate ugliness of returning to consciousness with the feeling of that burning neon pillar surrounding deep in the soft gray praying matter. It withdrew murmuring to hell with you, and added brightly, but then you're there, aren't you? The hurricane had indeed precisely been caused by a great mad bird as it flapped its immense wings. We had been traveling for close to a month, and had allowed passage open to us insufficient to lead us up there, directly under the North Pole where it had nightmared the creature for our torment. What whole cloth had he employed to create such a beast? Where you had gotten the concept from our minds, from his knowledge of everything that had ever been on this planet, he had now infested and ruled. In North mythology had sprung this eagle, this carrion bird, this rock thing. Ergomir, a winged creature, Arakan, incarnate, gigantic, the words immense, monstrous, grotesque, masses swollen, overpowering beyond description. There, the mound rising above us, the bird of winds heaved with its own irregular breathing, its snake neck arcing up into the gloom beneath the North Pole, supporting a head as large as Tordor Mansion, a beak that opened slowly as the jaws of most monstrous crocodiles ever conceived. Successfully, ridges of tufted flesh puckered about two evil eyes as cold as the view down into the glacier crevices. Ice blue and somehow moving liquidly, heaved once more, it lifted its great sweat-colored wings in movement that was certainly a shrug. Then settled and slept, talons, fangs, nail, and blades, it slept. Am appeared to us burning the bush, and he said we could kill the hurricane bird if he wanted to eat. We had not eaten a very long time, but even so, Orister merely shrugged. Then he began to shiver and he drooled. Ellen held him, to had him hungry, she said. I smiled at her, was trying to be reassuring, but it was phony as Nimdog's bravado. Bravado. Give us weapons, he demanded. The burning bush vanished, and there was two crude sets of bows and arrows, and a water pistol lying on the cold deck plates. I picked up a set. Useless. Nimdog swallowed heavily. We turned and started a long way back. The hurricane bird had blown us. About for a length of time we could not conceive. Most of that time we had been unconscious, but we had not eaten. A month on the march. To the bird itself without food. How much longer to find our way to the ice caverns and the promised canned goods? None of us cared to think about it. We would not die. We would be given filth and scum to eat, one of the kind or another, or nothing at all and would keep our bodies alive somehow in pain and agony. The bird slept back there, for how long it didn't matter when Anne was tired of its being there. It would vanish with all the meat, all that tender meat as we walked. The lunatic laughed as a fat woman rang high and around us in the computer chambers that led endlessly nowhere. It was not Ellen's laugh. She was not fat. I had not heard a laugh from 109 years. In fact, I had not heard walked. I was hungry. We moved slowly. There was often fainting. We would have to wait. One day he decided to cause an earthquake, at the same time rooting us to spot with nails through the soles of our shoes. Ellen and Nimdok were both caught when a fissure shot. Its lightning bolt opened across the floor plates. They disappeared and were gone. When the earthquake was over, we continued our way. Benny and Gorister and myself, Ellen and Nemdog, Turned to us later that night, which abruptly became a day as the heavenly legion were bore them to us with celestial chorus singing, Go down, Moses. The archangels circled several times and then dropped the hideously mangled bodies. We kept walking, and while later Ellen and Nimdok fell in behind us, they were no worse for wear. Now Ellen walked with a limp, and had left her that. It was a long trip to the ice caverns to find the can's food. And we kept talking about being cherries and Hawaiian fruit cocktails. I tried not to think about it. The hunger was something that had come to life. Even as Am had come to life, it was alive in my belly. Even as we were in the belly of Earth, Am wanted the similarities known to us. It was heightened, the hunger. There's no way to describe the pains of not having eaten for months brought us. And yet we were kept alive, 
stomachs that were merely cauldrons of acid, bubbling, foaming, always shooting spears of silver-thin pain into our chest. It was the pain of the terminal ulcer, terminal cancer, terminal paralysis. It was undenying pain. Passed through the caverns of the rats, passed the path of the boiling steam. We passed through the country of the blind. We passed through the slot of the spawn. We passed through the veil of tears. And we finally came to the ice caverns. Horizonly thousands of miles in which the ice had formed a blue silverish flacious. Our novas lived in the glass and down dropping stalactites as thick as glorious as diamonds that had been made to run like jelly and solidified in graceful eternities of smooth, sharp perfection. We saw the stack of sand canned guns and we tried to run to them. We fell in the snow. We got up and went on. And Benny shoved us away and went on at them. Pawed them, gummed, gnawed at them. And he could not open them. They had not given us a tool to open the cans. Benny had grabbed three core can of guava shells and began battered against the ice bank. The ice flew and shouted, but the can was merely dented. We heard the laughter of the fat lady. Ah, we're had an echoing down, down, and down the tundra. And he went completely mad with rage and began throwing cans as we scrabbled. Bowed in the snow and the ice trying to find a way to end helpless agony. Frustration, there was no way. And Benny's mouth began to drool and he flung himself hoarse. The instant I felt terribly calm. Surrounding by madness, surrounded by hunger, surrounded by everything but death. I knew that there was only one way out. Emmett kept us alive, but there was a way to defeat him. Not totally defeat, but at least peace. I would settle for that. I had to do it quickly. Benny was eating Gorister's face, Gorister on his side, thrashing snow. Benny wrapped around him with a powerful monkey legs, crushing Gorister's waist with his hands, locked around Gorister's head like a nutcracker, and his mouth ripped at the tender skin of Gorister's cheek. Gorister screamed with such gagged, jagged, edgy violence that stalactites fell. They plunged down softly, wrecking the receiving snowdrifts, spears, hundreds of them, everywhere, protruding from the snow. Benny's head pulled back sharply as she gave, as something gave all at once, and bleeding raw white dripping of flesh hung from his teeth. On his face, black angus, black against the white snow, dominoes in the chalk dust, and dark with no expression but eyes, all eyes, Forrester, half conscious. Benny now an animal. I knew Ann would let him play. Forrester would not die. But Benny would fill his stomach. I turned half to my right and drew a huge ice beetle from the snow. All in an instant. I drove the great ice point ahead of me like a battering ram. Braced against my right thigh. It struck Benny on the right side. Just under the rib cage and drove upward through his stomach and broke inside of him. He pitched forward and lay still. Forrester lay on his back. I pulled him the spear free and straddled him. I still moved, driving the spear straight down through his throat. His clothes of the cold penetrated it. His eyes closed as the cold penetrated. Ellen must have realized what I decided. Even as fear gripped her, she ran at Nemdok with a short icicle. As he screamed into his mouth, and the force of her rush did the job, his head jerked sharply as it had been nailed to the snow crusted behind him. All in an instant, there was an attorney beat of soundless anticipation. I could hear Am draw in his breath. His toys had been taken from him. Three of them was dead. could not be revived. He could keep us alive by his strength and talent, but he was not God. He could not bring them back. Ellen looked at me. Her ebony features stark against the snow that surrounded us. There was fear and pleading in her manner. The way she held herself ready... I know she had a heartbeat before Am would stop us. It was struck her. It struck her and she folded toward me, bleeding from the mouth. I could not read meaning into her expression. The hate pain had been too great and toward her face. But it might have been thank you. It's possible, please. Some hundred of years may have passed, I don't know. Am has been having fun for some time, accelerating and retarding the time since. I'll say the word now. Now. It took me ten months to say now. I don't know. I think it's been some hundred of years. 
He was furious. He wouldn't let me bury them. It didn't matter. There was no way to dig up deck plates. He dried up the snow and brought the night. He roared and sent locusts. They didn't do a thing. They stayed dead. It had him. I was furious. I had thought Am hated me before. I was wrong. It was not even a shadow of hate. He was now slaved from every prince circuit. He made certain I would suffer eternally and could not do myself in. I left my mind intact. I can dream, I can wander, I can lament. Remember all the four of them, I wish. Well, it doesn't make sense. I know I saved them. I know I saved them from what was happening to me. But I still cannot forget killing them. On its face, it isn't easy. Sometimes I want to. It doesn't matter. Am has altered me for his own peace of mind, I suppose. He doesn't want me to run at full speed in a computer bank and smash my skull while holding my breath till I faint or cut my throat on a rusted sheet of metal. There's reflective surfaces down here. I will describe myself as I see myself. I'm a great soft jelly thing, smoothly rounded with no mouth, pulsing white holes filled by fog where my eyes used to be. Rubbery appendages that were once my arms broken around it, down into ledgeless humps of soft, slippery matter. I leave a moist trail when I move, blotches of disease. Evil gray come and go on my surface as though light being beamed from within. Outwardly, dumbly, I shamble about a thing that could never have been known as human. Things whose shape is alien, is travesty, man it becomes more obscene vague resemblance, inward, alone, here living under the land, under the sea, in the belly of Am, was creating, because our time was badly spent, we must have known unconsciously, do it better, at least the four of them are safe, at last, Am will be all the matter for that, makes me a little happier, yet, Am has won, he's taken his revenge, I have no mouth. I must scream.